And now I have the pleasure of introducing Mike Nagel. Um, Mike has become, I've been here three years now, and he's become our go-to January speaker. And I've asked Mike every year to um, select topics that will make people think a little bit. Um, being a, a college professor, he's very great at taking controversial subjects or subjects where there might be um, differing viewpoints. And um, I always walk away from his lectures with a little bit different perspective than I may have walked in. So we asked um, Mike this year to talk a little bit about um, our federal government. And um, I think he's just gonna do a fine job of addressing the topic, especially with what's going on today. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Mike. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in education and a Master of Arts degree in history from Western Washington University in Bellingham, Washington. He teaches history and political science at West Shore Community College in Scottville, not too far down the road. And he also serves as the chair of the social services division there. Mike is an award-winning teacher and a noted speaker covering a range of topics in American history, Michigan history, and student success and retention in the online classroom. So I can probably get a lesson or two from him. He is the author of the Justice S. Stearns Michigan Pine King and Kentucky Coal Baron, 1845 to 1933. And that was published by Wayne State University Press. And I believe he's got a book in the works right now. Um, Mike lives in Ludington with his wife and two daughters. Without further ado, welcome Mike Nagel. Well, thank you. I, I really appreciate it. Can, can everyone hear me? Can you give me like just a thumbs up? Is that okay? All right. So uh, I appreciate the, the introduction, but I would even say I, I just appreciate the fact that you've invited me back uh, so many times. Um, it's 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 really nice. Uh, it's great to see the same faces so many times. And and although we're in a um, well, a person could call it kind of a sterile uh, environment with Zoom. Um, I think that there are more people here today uh, viewing than in the last couple of years. And so this is it's really nice to see so many people. And I also saw um, one of my friends from college uh, who's in the Seattle area right now. And so he would not have been able to participate. So this is just really neat. So thank you so much. All right, so um, I would like to uh, share my screen and I just wanted to kind of start here uh, with some things. Um, you know, uh, as, as Barb said last year, um, uh, Last it was in the summer, uh, maybe, uh, and then into the fall. She asked me to speak uh, about um, the presidency, maybe like limits on the president's authority in that, and um, and so I came up with it, and I had a, a you know a whole thing set up um, in October, and I worked on it over Christmas, and then we had last week, uh, and so the events of last week will actually influence some of this, but um, I just kind of wanted to to start with this idea, how much power should our chief executive have? And I'd like to begin by just starting with um, our first president, the, found, the father of the country, George Washington. Um, and if, if anyone is interested in, in learning more about uh, George Washington, uh, I would strongly recommend um, a book by Ron Chernow, uh, Washington of Life. If you're familiar with uh, Hamilton and the play, well, Ron Chernow wrote the biography of Alexander Hamilton. And so this was a biography of Washington. One of the things that's important to note about Washington is that he was very hesitant to assert authority. After all, the United States had just fought a war against a monarch whom they believed had overstepped his power and authority. And so Washington was very cautious in his actions. And the more I've come to study him, Washington was flawed, just as all humans are. But the more I've come to study him, the more respect I've had for him. At the end of the Revolutionary War, he willingly gave up power. Um, at the end of his second term, he, he purposefully chose not to run for a second term in office. And so I think that he's kind of like a good starting point there. Um, and if I can just kind of go back, I'm going to stop this here for a second. Uh, can you see me right now? No, you no, you can't. Um, I want to go, go like this. Okay, can you see me again? Okay, is that? Yeah, all right. So 
Um, I, I kind of want to go back and forth between my screen share and then also being able to see you and to see uh, some of the chat if that comes up. One thing that the, the approach that I want to take is more of a historical approach. I'm a historian. I kind of I try to understand the present by studying the past. I even try to predict the future by studying the past. So I'd like to look at some statistics, the use of veto power, uh, part, the number of pardons, executive orders, but then also explore some past presidents and how they have used executive power, but also with the focus on maybe the last four administrations, but particularly the Obama and the Trump administrations. And so that's kind of what, what I'd like to do uh, today. Um, so I'm gonna go back to my presentation here, okay? And okay, so, um, all right. Okay, so here's some statistics. Okay, can you see this all right? Can I get a thumbs up? Did you, okay, all right. So when you, when you look at different presidential administrations, you can go back and you can see uh, how did they assert their authority or not when it comes to the veto. Well, um, George Washington was hesitant to be really assertive and he only issued two vetoes during his presidency. Jefferson, none. The first president to use the veto more than others was Andrew Jackson. And in fact, he was the seventh president of the United States. He issued 12 vetoes during his administration, more than all of the previous six presidents combined. As a result, he was nicknamed or he was uh, uh, criticized by some as being King Andrew the uh, first. Here is a political cartoon from the 1830s. And notice he is, he has a robe uh, like a king would, he's got a crown. Um, and I don't know how well you can see this. So I'm gonna go, hopefully that is, can you see what he's standing on there? He's trampling on the United States constitution. He's stepping on it. It's been ripped to shreds. Uh, because of his use of the veto and because he believed that he was born to command is the, the point that this political cartoon was making at that time. Now, Jackson did more than just use veto power um, as a president, and he was really the, the first to expand presidential power in a lot of ways. One, thing, um, one other thing that he supported was uh, a policy of Indian removal, you may be familiar with this, like with the Cherokee Trail of Tears and that. He, he thought that Native Americans were a barrier to American economic expansion. And so he wanted Native Americans moved from the eastern portions of the country to areas west of the Mississippi River. Our courts declared that the Cherokee in particular, in one case, uh, were not supposed to be, you know, they were allowed to remain on their property. Well, um, reportedly, Andrew Jackson um, uh, made the statement, well, the chief justice has made his uh, decision, now let him enforce it. Now he may or may not have actually said that, but clearly his actions showed it and he tried to expand the power of the president, really the first to do so uh, in a large way. So let me go back and let's look at some more statistics here for different presidential administrations. All right, um, look at FDR, okay? Franklin Roosevelt, he was elected to the presidency four times. He died shortly into his fourth term. They changed the constitution following his death. Um, however, um, he clearly expanded the power of the presidency. And as the United States became a world power and as the United States uh, uh, went through the, the Great Depression and then into the Second World War, Presidents like Roosevelt and others who followed him expanded the power of the presidency. And we can see that through these use of statistics. Um, I mean, 635, are you kidding? Uh, uh, it's just, that's an expansion of presidential power. If we look at subsequent administrations, um, President Reagan in, in recent fairly, or fairly recent years, uh, we see issuing 78 vetoes. Um, uh, more recently, uh, we've got uh, Barack Obama with 12 and Donald Trump with 10. And I think, you know, because it was just so recent, 
uh, Trump issued the veto of the defense spending bill. Uh, well, it was in late December, and that was the one veto that was overridden uh, by Congress. And so we can see this use of statistics to uh, help explain um, some use of uh, presidential power, but it doesn't explain everything. Um, and so I'm going to stop the share just for a second. Okay. Um, and um, we've got three branches of government. Okay. Uh, and with those three branches, uh, they each have a job or a responsibility. It's the job of the legislative branch to write and to pass legislation. The judiciary, well, they interpret legislation or they interpret laws. The president, okay, the executive branch, the executive branch enforces laws. And executive orders have been used by presidents going back to George Washington to enforce legislation. And so I'm gonna go back to that screen share and look at some things here, okay? Um, executive orders have the legal force of law. Uh, and um, uh, it's not a lot, it's, it's straight from the, the, the White House. It cannot violate a law that's already in place and it cannot violate the constitution, but it provides guidance as to how a law should be enforced. The example that I like to give is, okay, let's just say it's uh, the speed limit is 70 miles an hour. I think we all know that we're not gonna get a speeding ticket if we're driving 73 miles an hour. If we're only three miles hour, an hour over the speed limit. Uh, the police enforce that regulation more strictly if you're maybe going 85 miles an hour. Uh, the executive orders allow the president to establish priorities and to say, okay, we want uh, to, um, uh, uh, to enforce a particular law at this particular level. It cannot violate the constitution or a law that's in place. Let me give an example. Uh, immigration is, is an excellent example, which I'll give here in a second, but an example that I think everyone is familiar with when it comes to executive orders would be the Emancipation Proclamation. During the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln declared that all of the slaves living in the states in rebellion against the Union would be free. That was an executive order issued by Lincoln, who, by the way, was another president who expanded the powers of the executive branch. One thing with executive orders is that they are, they are not binding for future administrations. There's a process that you need to go through uh, in order to change one executive order to another. Uh, however, they're just with one administration and the next administration can change them. So I suspect when we go from the Trump administration to the Biden administration, there will be a series of executive orders that uh, Joe Biden uh, will put into place that will nullify some um, of those that were put into place by President Trump. Just some examples here and some, some checks on the president. Um, we had the so-called travel ban or the Muslim ban uh, early on in President Trump's administration. He signed an executive order banning people coming from certain countries. Well, the first version of this that was struck down by the courts. Okay? Uh, the president issued a second executive order dealing with the travel ban. That was struck down by the courts. Eventually, however, um, uh, a third uh, a travel ban was put into place by the administration, and that was allowed to remain in place. But let's look at some statistics. Again, statistics can be insightful. They can help to provide uh, a visual. George Washington issued executive orders, but only one a year. Um, I, I looked through some statistics, and I tried to just find some that, that struck me. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant had two terms as president. Um, he issued 200. Look at Theodore Roosevelt, over a thousand. One thing that struck me is Warren Harding was president in the 1920s and he died about two years into his administration. He averaged over 200 executive orders a year. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt, okay. Uh, once again, uh, he issued the most. Um, but when we look in more detail, if, if we just kind of compare Obama and Trump, uh, you know, 
Barack Obama issued about as many as George W. Bush, fewer, far fewer than Bill Clinton. Uh, Donald Trump issued more per year than Barack Obama, but really 52 versus 35, that's not, you know, um, um, outside the, you know, it's pretty close. Um, and so, yes, Obama and Trump have used executive orders, but not necessarily as much as uh, some people might think. Uh, they've gotten a lot of press. Uh, there's been a lot of um, uh, discussion of them, but, but I think these statistics can be telling. Uh, one thing I did want to mention here um, is that I don't know if any of you are fans of Schoolhouse Rock uh, or of Saturday Night Live, but um, after this presentation, I, don't, I didn't think that we'd have enough time for this, uh, but they, uh, Saturday Night Live took Obama to task when uh, he issued one of his executive orders uh, creating DACA. Um, and um, uh, it's pretty funny. Uh, and so I would encourage you to, um, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to Google that after this presentation. Um, the president of the United States is the most powerful politician. He's the head of government. Uh, the president is also the head of state, uh, which means that the president is the symbolic leader of the country. Uh, and I think that this is, is uh, something that's, that's kind of helpful uh, to try to look at. If you think of the, with, in the United States, we have combined the position of head of government, the most powerful politician, and the head of state, the symbolic leader. In the British system, it's the easiest one to compare. Their head of government is the prime minister. He's the most, he or she would be the most powerful politician. Um, the symbolic leader under the British system well, that would be the queen, uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth II. But in the United States, we have chosen to combine those two offices. Well, it's led to some interesting things and, and different presidents have used this symbolic power in different ways. Okay, so there are different things that are done. Um, here we see President Obama hosting a state dinner. As the symbolic leader of the country, the president may contact the winner of the World Series, the Super Bowl, a, um, uh, an Olympic medal winner. And here we see George W. Bush throwing out the first pitch to start, um, uh, I think it was the World Series. Different presidents have been effective at using the radio, Franklin Roosevelt and his fireside chats. If I think everyone here would probably remember President Bush at ground zero just days after the attack on the World Trade Center and Pentagon. We've also seen presidents who um, have failed in this symbolic role. Uh, yeah. Bill Clinton was involved in a sex scandal and we had a lot of detail uh, concerning that. The same is true for President Trump as there were allegations that he had paid uh, an adult porn star to remain quiet in the months before the 2016 election. So some presidents have been able to thrive with this. Some have failed. President Reagan, boy, he was, he was excellent um, with this. When the Challenger, uh, d um, uh, uh, the, the rocket, the, the, the Challenger exploded, I think it was 1984, he brought the country together uh, in those days after that. Well, in addition to hosting state dinners, in addition to uh, throwing out the first pitch at baseball games, the president does have one power as the symbolic leader or as the head of state. The president has the authority to pardon anyone who's been convicted of federal crimes. And the text that's quoted here uh, is right from the constitution. This is a pretty widespread power. Uh, there are far, very few limitations on this in, according to the constitution. The only exception here is in cases of impeachment. So let's look at some statistics. Presidents have used this authority going back to George Washington who issued 16 pardons. Again, we're at Franklin Roosevelt with over 3,600. Uh, 3, Gerald Ford famously pardoned Richard Nixon for any crimes he had committed or might have committed in association with the Watergate scandal. George H.W. Bush didn't issue very many pardons, 
but I don't know if you, some were controversial. Uh, uh, several individuals associated in the Iran-Contra scandal uh, were uh, pardoned. Bill Clinton, the last day of his presidency. Again, you know, you can see how many he had there, um, but he pardoned uh, the spouse of a large democratic donor, Mark Rich. He also pardoned his own brother. Um, Barack Obama, 1,900 pardons. Donald Trump, fewer than 100. Uh, and this is um, up to about January 1. Um, uh, it, it's very typical for presidents to issue many pardons in about the week before uh, they leave office. Um, all right, so let me go like this. There is a process that's in place and it's been in place for about 125 years uh, in order to, um, uh, to, to receive a pardon. There is a, it's called the, you go through the office of, um, uh, uh, well, it's, it's through the justice department and there's a process you could fill out a form and you can receive a pardon. Obama had what, 1900 some uh, pardons. His focus was on drug related uh, uh, people who were convicted of drug-related crimes, maybe about 1,700 of the 1,900. Uh, so we had the war on drugs uh, in the 1980s and the 1990s. And uh, um, if people were non-violent offenders, President Obama wanted to, um, uh, wanted to uh, allow for people uh, to, to um, uh, he, he wanted to, to lower those sentences. Um, so I see that there's a question. Uh, do you have a view on president's power to pardon himself? Um, I would agree with uh, former attorney general, William Barr, uh, who says the answer to that is no. Uh, and also um, Richard Nixon, when he was in the White House uh, during the Watergate scandal, apparently he sought some, some feedback to see uh, uh, how that would be received. And he was told, no, the president does not have the power to do that. Um, one thing that I would say is it's never been tested in court. Uh, however, those were opinions issued by Bill Barr uh, and then the Attorney General uh, back in the 1970s. So yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, okay, so I did want to show uh, one other thing here um, with uh, this next slide. Um, so as I say here, here this is a uh, uh, somebody judge. Uh, I was you know you you uh, uh, beat me to the punch uh, with uh, the president being able to pardon himself. Uh, and here you see just kind of a visual associated with um, uh, with uh, uh, President Obama as well as President Trump. Uh, Pat Toomey, who is a Republican senator from Pennsylvania, has said that the President Trump's use of the pardon is legal so far is legal, it's constitutional, but he's called it a quote, misuse of power because he's pardoned individuals such as Roger Stone and Paul Manafort because they had close ties to, um, uh, to, to President Trump. And um, uh, it, you may be interested in this segment in NPR that was done just a couple of days ago. In it, a former Justice Department official argued, quote, at least 85 of 94 of the pardons uh, that President Trump has issued um, were either linked to him personally or politically, or there was a po personal or political connection to President Trump. Um, and so different presidents have used this in different ways, but according to the constitution, there are very few restrictions. Um, next, what I'd like to do is I'd like to look at um, a historical example. And you know, for this, um, I think that statistics can be helpful. Statistics can, can provide a focus, but um, we need to look at things in, in a practical manner as well. Um, I also thought right now, um, did anybody else want to offer a question or, or uh, make a point or um, maybe this is a good time for me to, to just see uh, uh, if there was. So um, there's a question I don't know if everyone can see this, but uh, Trump has been impeached. Hasn't he lost the power to pardon? So he isn't able to pardon himself. Um, that's a good question. Um, just because he's been impeached, I don't think that he has lost the power to pardon. 
Um, uh, I think, you know, he would have to be removed from office uh, and, and removed as president. So there, uh, I, and, and that issue of being able to pardon himself, most scholars would agree with Bill Barr and, and back in the 1970s to the attorney general then, uh, who said that the president does not have the authority to do that. And so um, the president conti will continue to remain with all of the powers that he has right now. Just because he's been impeached, that does not, not mean that he's been removed. There needs to be a trial. The trial would take place in the Senate. And at the end of that trial, each senator would act as a juror and you would need a two thirds majority vote to remove the president from office. Uh, Bill Clinton was impeached, but there were not enough votes to remove him. Uh, Donald Trump was impeached last December. And then in January, I think it was, is when his trial was. And just yesterday, he was impeached again. Um, however, um, uh, he has not been removed from office. So that's a good question. All right, so um, what we'll see here and what I'd like to do next is I'd like to look at kind of a comparison and contrast between um, John Kennedy and uh, Lyndon Johnson. Okay, can you see that? Okay now, yeah, I think so, all right, okay. So John Kennedy, um, we remember him as a great public speaker. We remember the youth that he brought to the White House. We remember his beautiful wife and the fact that he died in service to our country when he was murdered. The core of his domestic policy had a nickname. It was called the New Frontier. It argued, he argued that he wanted to fight poverty, provide federal aid to education, to implement a system of health care for the elderly, and he wanted to focus on civil rights. What we remember about John Kennedy is his great speaking ability and the, and the optimism associated with his administration. However, he failed when it came to passing this legislation. And it wasn't just because of his assassination. Kennedy felt it was beneath him to lobby individual members of Congress to support his policies. There was a little bit of a different focus for this man, his vice president, Lyndon Johnson. Prior to serving as Kennedy's vice president, Johnson was the Senate majority leader. In the 1950s, Lyndon Johnson was arguably maybe the third most powerful person in Washington, D.C. Um, there's also a great story about Lyndon Johnson. Um, Johnson first arrived in Washington, D.C. In, uh, uh, when he was in his 20s as a staff member. And he went to D.C. as this young guy, and he knew that politics was personal. And often it was influenced by personal relationships that, that politicians would have with one another. Well, he lived in a boarding house with 75 other congressional staffers. The first night that he arrived, that night um, he, he went and took a shower kind of early in the evening. Um, and he got to know the, the, the other gentlemen who were uh, taking showers at that time. And he went back to his room and he waited about 15 minutes. And then he took another shower and he got to know that group of guys. Okay? And then he went back to his room and he waited a while and he went back uh, and he took another shower. He was clean. Okay? Um, four times he took showers that evening. Okay? The next morning, he brushed his teeth four different times. Okay? And he got to know different groups of congressional staffers, the early risers, those who got up a little bit later. Okay? And he developed a personal relationship with them. He did this every day for the first couple of weeks uh, that he was in DC. At the end of three months, an election of sorts was held to try to determine who the leader of the congressional staffers were who won that election, but Lyndon Johnson. He recognized politics was personal. And so he took a personal approach to legislation. Notice on the right, this image, Lyndon Johnson was famous for the Johnson treatment. Here, he's got his face in, uh, right in the um, personal space of uh, Abe Fortas, who eventually was a Supreme Court justice. Johnson was a large man. He was tall, he was intimidating. Some historians have described him as a bully. 
Here we see Johnson having a discussion with another member of the Senate. His name was Theodore Green. Johnson then enters into his personal space. And then we see Johnson getting even closer. Okay, Johnson, Johnson's style uh, was, was uh, well recognized. He was willing to call people at any time of the night or the morning to try to lobby them to support legislation that he wanted. John Kennedy wanted to fight poverty, provide federal aid to education, a healthcare system for the elderly and civil rights. He failed. Lyndon Johnson had this thing called the Great Society. He didn't fight poverty. He declared war, unconditional war on poverty. Federal funding during his administration for public education increased. Programs like the Economic Opportunity Act provided funding for things like Head Start, vocational training for low-income individuals, low-income housing. We see Medicare becoming law. And a Civil Rights Act in 1964 that outlawed discrimination in public places and brought an end to legal Jim Crow and the Voting Rights Act, which expanded the right to vote for many. So we remember John Kennedy and the ideals that he brought to the White House and the optimism. Um, Johnson got things done. Um, he wasn't elegant. He wasn't as, as um, uh, 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 he wasn't the great speaker that Kennedy was, uh, but he got things done and accomplished. All right, any questions? Because uh, what I'd like to do next is I'd like to do a bit of a comparison between President Obama and Trump. And it's kind of interesting when you look at Obama, um, uh, we're gonna see some rhetoric on the part of President Obama and then reality. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's kind of interesting, I think. Okay. All right, so. In the days, less than a week, well, in one week after the attacks on the World Trade Center and Pentagon, Congress passed what was called AUMF, the Authorization for the Use of Military Force. It gave the president tremendous powers to fight terrorism in the United States as well as abroad. Well, President Obama delivered a speech where he said, Congress needs to act. Congress needs to take action and repeal this power that the president has. And he talked about that and there was a tremendous, uh, you know, it was a focus of several speeches. Yet, that was the rhetoric. Yet, in reality, his administration really relied heavily on the use of drone strikes. And I don't know if anyone remembers this, but I think it was the longest uh, filibuster in recent years, but Rand Paul, uh, Senator from Kentucky, uh, he had a filibuster where he wanted to know for sure, would drone strikes be used against American citizens? And so that was one thing for President Obama. Another thing with Obama, okay, when it came to uh, immigration issues, Congress didn't get their job done. Congress recognized, members of Congress recognized that there was an issue when it came to immigration. Obama talked about Congress needing to do their job. He declared he didn't have the authority to do it. Congress had to do this. Yet, after months and months of Congress's inaction, he then said, okay, I'm going to issue an executive order. And that's what created the um, DACA program, uh, the Deferred uh, Action for Childhood Arrivals. Uh, and this is where, you know, um, uh, if you uh, watch that uh, Saturday, night, Saturday Night Live video, um, where SNL um, um, uh, takes Obama to task. How about President Trump? Okay. Particularly in the last year, President Trump, and throughout his administration, but particularly in the last year, President Trump is focused on vision. He's focused on big picture, okay? America first would be his theme. Okay? Um, uh, he wanted to address bigger picture things as opposed to the nuts and bolts of lawmaking and negotiation. Maybe the best example of this 
would be in, in the last several months uh, where he did not take the lead when it came to uh, relief bills uh, for uh, you know, uh, COVID, um, COVID relief and stimulus. He had his Secretary of the Treasury, Stephen Mnuchin, take the lead on this. Uh, and in fact, Congress uh, took uh, Mnuchin's lead. The, the White House said that the president would support it. And I don't know if you remember this, but in late December, uh, President Trump then criticized the deal that he had initially supported and that his treasury secretary had negotiated. And he described those $600 payments as ridiculously low. I don't know if you remember that or not, but um, uh, it's just kind of interesting. With President Trump, often his focus is on vision um, as opposed to the nuts and bolts of passing legislation. While in some cases, the president has allowed others to take the lead, one area where we really see the president focused okay, would be on the 2020 election. And I don't know how many of you uh, uh, listened, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, the, the what uh, about a, an hour, 65 minute phone conversation uh, between President Trump and the Secretary of State um, in Georgia, who, and, and President Trump repeatedly, well, he, he said that he just wanted the Secretary of State to find 11,780 11, votes. Um, President Trump has, has really taken the forefront with uh, the, the, the election of 2020. He pressured the governor of Georgia to call a special session uh, in order to replace the state's electors. Uh, the, in the state of Michigan, the president um, asked leaders of the state legislature to come to the White House and he lobbied them. Uh, uh, he's, as I said before, um, he challenged the Georgia Secretary of State to find additional votes. President Trump also called upon Vice President Pence in the days leading up to January 6th uh, to show extreme courage and essentially disavow the electoral votes from several states. So that was an area where President Trump uh, took the forefront and took the lead. Um, and then we have the events of last week. As Congress was in session to certify the electoral votes uh, um, sent from each state, and following a speech by President Trump, numerous supporters stormed the US Capitol. Um, their actions have been described as sedition and insurrection. It was a violent assault by a mob. The American Historical Association has described those events. Oh, I don't have my notes here. I had this out for, here we are. Uh, describe those events as an assault on the very principle of representative democracy that received the explicit and indirect support from the White House. The last time the, the uh, White House was um, uh, overrun like this was during the War of 1812, and it was the British who uh, engaged in that, not American citizens. And I see that we have a uh, president. So have any previous presidents been convicted of crimes after their presidency is over? To my knowledge, the answer to that is no. I, I am unaware of any president uh, who's ever been convicted. Um, and maybe this is, uh, this is going beyond your question, but when, in the case of um, uh, Richard Nixon, the reason why Gerald Ford uh, pardoned Richard Nixon is that he thought that it would be, it would help the nation to heal and it would be better for the nation to move on and to not try to uh, convict him of, of any crimes. And so that's why he issued that pardon. But I'm trying to think of any president convicted of anything. And, and I, off the top of my head, I, I cannot think of any examples. Yeah. Um, does anyone else have a question?
Uh, and by the way, Barb, just make sure to, to let me know if one comes up. But you know, I, these images were, I think, um, deeply disturbing for all of us. Uh, these images, uh, whether it's, um, uh, you know, there were a lot of people at the rally in President Trump's speech. Not all of those people then stormed the Capitol. I think that that's something that's important. But we also see, you know, the Confederate flag, really? Um, I don't have an image of it here, but uh, a scaffolding and noose that was in place for Vice President Pence? Um, wow. Uh, several Republicans have commented on the recent actions and on the president's uh, uh, speech. President Trump has described his actions as, quote, totally appropriate. Yesterday, uh, he also condemned the violence. Um, Attorney General Barr, who's, who left his position as Attorney General uh, prior to this, it, it was uh, sometime in December, sometime right before Christmas, I think it was. He described the president's conduct as a betrayal of his office. And he declared that the president was involved in orchestrating a mob to pressure Congress. The previous, the, the Secretary of Transportation was Elaine Chao, who's also uh, married to Mitch McConnell. Uh, she was a member of President George W. Bush's cabinet. And she also was Secretary of Transportation for President Trump until she resigned after the events of last week, she declared that she was deeply troubled uh, and simply uh, could not set aside what had happened. Betsy DeVos, Secretary of Education, until she resigned, described uh, the events as unconscionable and pointed a finger directly at President Trump with his rhetoric. And then um, just recently, Liz Cheney, who's the number three Republican in the House of Representatives, declared that there had never been a greater betrayal by a president. I'm guessing we have some more shacks. Um, so I'm guessing this probably, okay. So how do you feel about the rumor of Trump hiding behind the people that stormed to try to keep from being impeached and be held accountable? Um, how do I feel about the rumor of Trump hiding behind the people? So like um, the president's blaming others and not himself and not taking responsibility, I think. Is that, um, Leanne, is that, is that right? I'm seeing, okay, all right. Um, personally, I think that the president's words and actions, not only on the 6th, but leading up to that, contributed to the events of January 6th. That's my opinion. Um, I, I get upset at Fox News and MSNBC when they don't, um, when they uh, uh, don't say this is commentary or this is editorializing, you know, and that I'm editorializing right now. Okay. <laughs> I try to be neutral. All right. But, but um, since you asked, um, I do think that the president uh, should bear responsibility. And in fact, you didn't ask this, but I think, I wish that Vice President Pence had invoked the 25th Amendment. Um, again, that's editorializing um, uh, and, and uh, so on my part. Um, so I would not call Trump visionary when he messed around in the vote counting, pressuring officials to overturn uh, uh, the election. Okay, oh, oh yeah, okay. So um, I use the word vision uh, uh, in, in an attempt to try to say, when it came to like the tax cut, uh, Donald Trump's vision was to have a tax cut uh, during that took place during the, the early part of his administration. He wanted to build a wall. Uh, he wanted America first. And so I think that's, that's the vision that I was, um, uh, you know, trying to focus on there um, uh, with that. Um, oh, what does the number three Republican mean? Okay. So the top Republican in the House of Representatives right now is Kevin McCarthy. He is the House Minority Leader. The Democrats are in the majority. So, so Kevin McCarthy is the top, uh, the number one Republican. Um, below him is Steve Scalise, who is the House Minority Whip. So he's the number two Republican. And um, um, uh, Liz Cheney uh, is the number three. She's the head of the Republican Caucus. Uh, uh, that's that's her title. She's supposed to like keep all the Republicans together, um, and that. And so she's just. You know, they, they each party holds elections. The Democrats held an election 
uh, Democrats in the House of Representatives held an election and they took they chose as their top person Nancy Pelosi. So she's the speaker there because they're in the majority. Steny Hoyer is another top uh, uh, Democrat in the House, um, as well as um, ah, it's from South Carolina. His name is uh, I'm forgetting his name, but anyway, so that's that's a good question. Um, I think that's that for right now. Um, okay. So I, th I think that um, words count, words matter. Um, you know, the events were disturbing last week. Uh, I was glued to my television for six or seven hours. The next day I listened to President Trump's speech it, because it was recorded, it was on YouTube. I wanted to hear what he had to say. I did not watch it live, but I, I listened to, his words were about 75 minutes, I think something like that. And I listened to like 60 minutes of it. I didn't listen to the whole thing, but I listened to a lot of it. Let's go back to this guy. Remember him? George Washington. Okay. He was very hesitant to assert presidential authority. Um, this idea of expanding presidential authority is not a Donald Trump issue. It's not a Barack Obama issue. It is not a Democratic issue. It's not a Republican issue. It's whomever is in the White House at the time particularly since the United States became a world power, and particularly uh, uh, you know, in the 20th century, where, as the government grew in size and power to fight the Great Depression. And then it grew even more to fight against imperialistic Japan and Nazi Germany okay, in the oh. Second World War. Um, and so I think that those Party are some good um, uh, uh, things to think of. So um, I, I, I want to be cognizant of, of um, fatigue associated with Zoom, but I'd like to open it up to, to more questions in that. And I don't know if people um, are interested in any, uh, you know, additional information on impeachment or the 25th Amendment or anything, but I just wanted to, to I'd like to see, um, oh, uh, is it Clayburn? Is it uh, Clyburn? Uh, uh, Clyburn is the um, uh, the number three Democrat in the in the House, and if I remember correctly, James Clyburn. Okay, there's a great story about him. Where did he meet his wife? Prison. They were both. He's African American. His wife is African American, and they were both engaged in sit-ins uh, uh, during the Civil Rights era, and that's where they met. Uh, so, just kind of an interesting, um, uh, you know, uh, tidbit about him. So there is a group of mainly GOP members who push uh, for the unitary executive, which means giving the president lots of power. Yeah, Bill Barr, William, William Barr, the attorney general, he was a strong supporter of that. Um, okay, so it, in many ways, it, it goes back to the 1970s after Richard Nixon was nearly impeached and basically forced to resign. There was a recognition, a bipartisan recognition that it seemed as if he had abused his power and most uh, officials wanted to curtail the power of the executive branch. Well, Donald Rumsfeld, okay, uh, who was Richard Nixon's Secretary of Defense, who by the way, set the record as being the youngest Secretary of Defense. Then he was Secretary of Defense for George W. Bush and he became the oldest Secretary of Defense. But, but anyway, um, Rumsfeld and uh, many others were upset about this. And when Gerald Ford uh, assumed the presidency following Nixon's resignation, and and this uh, this idea of trying to make sure that the president has enough authority uh, is something that um, uh, you know gained traction. Um, the unitary executive. What are the ramifications of a second impeachment? Okay. Well, it is historic. Um, no president. So Donald Trump was the third president to be impeached. Um, Andrew Johnson, who followed Abraham Lincoln in the White House, was impeached uh, largely because he, he, he did not support the, uh, protecting the rights of former slaves. And so Republicans in Congress impeached him. Uh, but 
he was not removed from office. There were not enough votes. Uh, and so he remained president. Um, uh, Bill Clinton was impeached, second in, uh, associated with the Monica Lewinsky scandal. And then um, Donald Trump was impeached, but he remained in office. Uh, there was no convictions. Uh, what could happen is that uh, the, the president could be prohibited from holding federal office ever again. And so I'm gonna go back to my screen share because I thought that there might be some questions about this. And um, so I got this. So in, in, here's, you know, impeachment does not mean removal from office. It's kind of like an indictment. Okay? Uh, if you're accused of a crime, then, then you would uh, uh, get a trial. So, so there would be a trial uh, to remove the president. Um, president's been, in, we've had three presidential impeachments. So this is article one, section three of the constitution. Impeachment cannot extend any further than removal from office and potentially disqualification to hold any office of honor, trust, or profit in the United States. So we've never seen this with the chief executive. It's possible that this could, um, if there is a Senate trial, and if particularly there's a two thirds majority to convict the president, it's possible that the president could lose secret service protection. It's possible the president could lose any um, um, retirement benefits. It's possible the president could be prohibited from running from office again. So that's the limit in terms of what Congress could do. Um, I assume that people are probably familiar that the state of New York may indict the president once he leaves the office uh, because of violation of state law. Um, there's no protection there. Um, and even if the president was to receive a pardon um, from the president of the United, from the subsequent president of the United States, uh, he would still be subject to that. So there's no you know, uh, state law uh, he could still uh, be convicted of, or yeah, of state law uh, and indicted. Um, yeah. Um, I wonder if anyone else has a question. I don't know if um if it's easier if people would prefer to, you know, if one person unmuted. Maybe we've got fifty people. So if we had, okay, so. Is there one? There, did you want to ask a question, Barb? No, I was just um, being available in case anyone wanted to ask me anything either. This is great, Mike. I really appreciate your perspective. I think it's always interesting to see the comparisons between presidents and they're not always what you think they're going to be. You surprised me in a few things tonight. <laughs> Does anybody else have any feedback for Mike or any questions? or feedback for us on the, how this presentation went or how this format went. Well, terrific. We had a total of 51 screens tonight. I am thrilled. And so please pre um, send um, this information going forward to your friends and family. Uh, look for our new website and um, share your ideas. We'd love to hear from you. So it sounds like Kelly expects us to have everything memorized, a set, costumes, everything ready to go on Monday. Well, that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got some stuff. I think I need to do it in the kitchen so I can put a banner, a happy birthday banner across I'm behind me. I'm in the me. middle of a Zoom meeting here. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> I thought that was a little off there. So well, I guess we'll wind up if, unless anybody else wants to raise their hand for a question or type something in. I think we'll um, lead off. You did have some great comments, Mike, um, from folks. So we appreciate you leaving those. Thanks so much, everybody. Marcia, Marcia had a question. Oh, you have a question, Mary? Sorry. No, oh, Marcia did. Marcia. Oh, Marcia Curran? Go ahead. She has to unmute herself. Oh, thanks, Mary. Uh, <laughs> hi, Barb. Hi, Mar I'm Marcia. Thank you for a great talk. Um, I just thought maybe you should mention, the, um, Mike, maybe you should mention the 14th Amendment, Section 3 or Paragraph 3, whatever it is, because that seems to be talked about a lot today. And that's okay. part of the picture as well. Um, could you remind me 
because um, what I'm thinking of is that that was specifically designed toward it. When it was written, it was to those who had committed treason, like who had fought for the Confederacy. In the Confederacy. Right. And was it that um, they could possibly lose the right to vote? Was that it? I'm not, I just, they, I just they can't would remember. lose. Actually, there's a lot of discussion of it. I can send you something later that okay. a lawyer just sent me. Um, it's, what it does is the Senate would have to, after they vote to indict or to uh, convict, mm -hmm. th that would be a two thirds majority. Then there would be a vote on if somebody moved it as such on the 14th amendment uh, section three of the 14th amendment, I think it's called, I, I don't have it in front of me, but um, that would be a simple majority and it would deny the president, um, all uh, the former president, all kinds of support from the federal government and also the in, gave, uh, refused to let him um, ha have any, um, any, federal uh, official role in the future. Okay. And, and so it's, is it section three or section four, section three of the 14th amendment? Right. Okay. So no person shall be a Senator or representative in Congress uh, or be president, blah, 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 who was taking an oath or remember to support the constitution. Okay. So if you've engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the government, you would lose more power. Okay. So that's what that is. Yep. Thank you. And I think it sounds like um, you wouldn't even have to convict him of under impeachment. You could still um, pass a, a ruling or a law that says he's not capable of having those rights anymore. He would, would have to be found guilty of, of sedition. Of yeah. sedition. Right. And that takes a court ruling. Oh, good. Thank you, Bruce. That's yeah. good. Thanks, Bruce. Well, I, let me just say uh, thank you, everyone, for your patience. Um, uh, I know that Zoom is a bit awkward, and 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 I wanted to kind of go back and forth uh, uh, with with the slides and that. So um, thank you so much, and thank you to the Benzie Historical Society. And um, I hope we can do this again. And and really appreciate uh, all of all, all of the people who took the time out of their day uh, today. So take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. We'll see you next January. Okay. Sooner. Right. Thanks, everybody. We really appreciate it. And um, do email us at info at org if you'd like any information um, or just want to give us some feedback. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. It's good to see you all. I've missed you.